Okay, I'm just waiting for more participants to join and then I will start in a moment. I think the numbers are just rising, so I'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay, so welcome to this morning's virtual information seminar on collagen six related congenital neuromuscular conditions. Conditions we'll be covering today will include auric congenital muscular dystrophy and Bethlehem myopathy. I'm Neeru Nayak. I'm MD UK's Deputy Director of Care Campaigns and Support. So we've got a packed agenda this morning with a fantastic array of speakers and we're going to split the session into two parts, beginning with a look at the latest developments around research into collagen 6 related congenital neuromuscular conditions, the patient registries and a chance to ask any questions you might have on these topics. We'll then move on to a discussion living with Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy and Bethlehem myopathy, where we'll focus on answering your questions as well as covering as many as we can that have been submitted in advance. We'll be using the Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So please type in your questions or comments and we'll feed them into the discussion. Please type in your questions as you think of them and we will try and go through all of them in the session. If we don't get to them, we will We'll contact you after the seminar. So to help us manage the technical side of the event, we won't be calling on questionnaires to ask their questions directly. And like I said, we'll cover any questions we haven't afterwards. So before we begin, just a note that our helpline is available to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions. So do please contact us if you have any questions or you need some support. We can help you with information and we can either support or direct you or we can either support you directly or point you into the direction of where you can get support to so signpost you. So the numbers and email should be on your email address should be on your screen now. You can call us on 0800 652 6352 or you can email us on info at muscular dystrophy uk.org and finally a reminder that we're recording this session so it will be made available in the next few days. My colleague John Copier will be chairing the first part of today's session to start us off this morning and I'm delighted to hand over to John to introduce himself and the research speakers. Thank you John. Thanks Nero. Good morning everyone. I'm John Copier. I'm the research manager here at Muscular Dystrophy UK and it's my pleasure to chair this research session this morning. We have two speakers covering quite different aspects of research into collagen 6 related dystrophies. Um, I'd like to remind you, you can post any questions in the chat and for each of the research uh, uh, session speakers, I I'll ask those questions after each talk. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Haiyan Zhu, who is the Associate Professor in Genetic Therapy at University College London and the 2021 UK Harrington Rare Disease Scholar. She also holds various academic positions, including Director of the Rare Disease Node on Nucleic Acid Therapy for the Medical Research Council and the National Institute of Health Research. Her, focus, um, her research focus is on preclinical development and translation of nucleic acid therapies for rare genetic disorders. Dr. Xu is the principal investigator on a series of research projects on the development of RNA therapeutics for a wide range of genetic conditions, including collagen 6 related muscular dystrophy, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and spinal muscular atrophy. Hi, Anne. Welcome. Thanks for coming today. I'll hand over to you now for your talk. Thanks very, very much, John, and thank you for this opportunity to share our research and also the update in the collagen 6 CMD. Uh, areas. I'm going to start to share my.
Can you see the full screen? Excellent. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, so I will give a, a brief update about the latest research into this condition. And then so my talk the, in the next 20 minutes, the talk will cover two uh, parts. One is the update of the very recent International Collagen 6 Research Summit meeting happened in November last year. And then I will uh, another update about the current situation of experimental therapy development for Collagen 6 CMD. So the first one, this this meeting happened in November uh, in Spain. So it's a group, a large group of uh, in, uh, international researchers who are dedicated to collagen six uh, research and the clinical work. So we gathered together and discussed about a lot of things about collagen six in, uh, from the basic research and then uh, clinical study as well. So this is a. It just part of the uh, with the name of the part of the uh, participant of this uh, con uh, the consortium meeting. So it include Kasten from NIH, Francesco and my group from UCL and the uh, Tedesco's group, and also a few group from Spain and from France as well. So the, the aim of the consortium of the meeting is to develop, to find the effective therapeutic approach for the treatment of, or cure of this condition. We work very hard. You can see the topic cover a lot of areas. So this is the specific goals and considering what we have done and based on each group's expertise. So the topic covers the therapeutic identification is always the top priority. So we, we discuss about different uh, therapeutic st strategies and uh, anything new we can do, any existing expertise we can share with each other and how to facilitate the clinical translation. Second one, we discuss about different model system, including animal model. And so far, we already have the humanized the deep intronic mutation model, the knockout A1, A1, A2 mouse model, and some others. Do we need more? Or if animal model is really needed based on the recent FDA guideline? So that's something we have discussed. And the, another preclinical validation is, uh, to, is uh, that's still about therapy. To, so we still need to do lots of work about to test the capacity, uh, test the efficacy and also safety of all those experimental therapy we have been developing before we uh, uh, we can say yes it can can be moved to uh, trial, and the first one is uh, delivery system. Uh, so it's, uh, I will talk about that one later. On. It's very it's quite crucial. So how efficient those uh, therapy can be delivered and the target the the cell, which is quite specific um, in collagen six CMD. Uh, we also talk about clinical trial readiness that need a lot of work for biomarker study and uh, also the clinical facilities uh, with the capacity of the clinical research facility. And then the next one with um. So we talk about PPIE, how to get our patients engaged with all these research activities, and then also about the collaboration, international collaboration for ex expertise, knowledge exchange, and data sharing. That's always a key um, for this, I mean, lots of the rare disease research. So this is a few key part we have been uh, discussing uh, at the at the meeting and also the following uh, post uh, post consortium meeting catch up in uh, last month as well. And the next will be the a brief update of the experimental therapy we our group and others we have been working on. So based on the type of mutations, we separate them as two major uh, strategies. One is the RNA therapy, and which mainly focuses on the dominant mutation. And then another is AV gene therapy approach, which uh, we are developing for the recessive or loss of function uh, condition. So I will focus on the first, I'll focus on the RNA therapy strategy. So we have the lots of different strategy we have been uh, developing. And the two major one, one is you might have already read from our publication, one is um, 
mutinelial specific silencing, uh, where we would like to just uh, uh, remove the uh, the copy so with the mutation, the mutant copy, and keep the normal copy there. So we know by remove half of the copy, half of the gene, it should be it should be safe and is as a therapeutic approach. So another one, so we have a, uh, quite a few uh, research group working on that, the allele specific silencing now. And then another one is a pseudo, pseudo exon skipping, which particular uh, develop particular for the deep introning mutation in collagen A. A1. So that one is uh, using axon skipping approach, which is similar to what we did in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we also talk about there are also some other new approaches, for example, gene editing and RNA editing approach. So, uh, this is a very brief summary of uh, different therapeutic approach we have been using. And then here is a summary of the, then. Uh, because all these approach, all these uh, therapeutic approaches, they are mutation specific. So for that reason, we we put we analyze the mutations here. Focus on dominant mutation in the three collagen six uh, A genes. So we put them and analyze group them. Uh, you can see so most of them, most of the. So we said there are splice side mutation, a mesense mutation that mainly concern gly uh, glycine to arginine substitution, and also the deep intron mutation. You can see most of the most of the common mutations are recurrent uh, splice side mutation, and which call called in frame axon deletion. And another one here, you see the deep intron mutation. DP intronic mutation, which is also as a single mutation, the highest the frequency about 16% uh, of our, our children, they affect by this mutation. And another another one third of the mutation is a missense glycine to arginine substitution. So we group them and uh, design different uh, RNA approach to target them. So this is the one explanation how a little specific silencing uh, antisense approach work. Here antisense, I know uh, um, our charity MDK, we usually call, call it uh, molecular patch. So it's the same, as here I use antisense, so it's the same thing. So this is in, health, uh, in healthy condition, we have two copies and then the collagen stakes uh, gene, uh, we, so each A1, A2, A3, they make um, once they uh, from the gene to, as a protein, uh, as alpha chain protein, they need to make a monomer. So A1, A2, A3, they make a monomer. And then the monomer will uh, assemble as a, a dimer and then make a tetramer. So as a tetramer, they can be secreted from inside of the cell and to outside of the cell. And then they make this lovely beaded uh, microfibril and that's how collagen cells um, play the function. So in cell culture, you will see this is a health, uh, if it's a uh, healthy, uh, skin fibroblasts, a uh, collagen six look like that. That's the green. But if there is uh, for the dominant mutation, affect one copy of the gene, and then the monomer will be defected, and then that will affect the assembly of dimer and then tetramer. So the gene. A protein cannot be, or tetramer cannot be secreted to outside of the cell, and you will see here in the cell. Let me just one second. So, so here you can see in cell culture, the collagen six protein get accumu accumulated inside the cell and the loops of um, cannot play the normal function outside the cell. And so what we have developed a little specific silencing, which is we 
we design some uh, the molecular patch or antisense and silence the mutant uh, copy. So even one copy left, but it's normal with normal function. And then so we can restore the function of the collagen uh, six. So they can still be secreted to extracellular matrix and the play the function that you can see in cultured cell after the treatment of uh, ASO. And then you can see the collagen six outside of the cell. Um, in the in the last uh, quite a few years, we have this, so for allele specific silencing, we have developed quite a lot of different approaches. For example, we can uh, the first uh, report is uh, in twenty twelve in is an Italian group. They talk about uh, use by switching ASO to silence a mutant allele, and then. It's 2014, two papers. One use, they both use siRNA, small interfering RNA to silence the mutant transcript. So that one target the glycine to arginine substitute, which is also a very common recurrent mutation. Another one is for the splice mutation, it's collagen A3, A1, A3. And then we also, later on, we also report to use uh, GAPMA ASO to, for this allele specific silencing that's from uh, my group. So we have, you can see that a few different approaches can be used for, to, for this allele specific silencing approach. And then for another type of mutations, it's deep intronic mutation. And uh, we, so we, did, we developed this axon skipping approach. So how it works, so this is a, when, uh, this is the normal condition. So we have exon 11, exon 12 in the, the transcript. And then, but if the, uh, because the mutation inside the intron, intron 11 here, and then that caused a small part of intron being transcripted to put to put in the in the RNA and the later on in the protein. So that affects the, uh, alpha one chain function, and then so what we we did is we designed the ASO uh, or molecular patch to remove this the small part of which shouldn't stay there. So get rid of it. So there's so axon skipping, and then to restore the normal function. So a uh, two group uh, have been focusing on this mutation that from Kasten's group and also from our group here, uh, Veronica Bo Boduk from Kasten group and Sarah Gudi from our group. So we, did, we have uh, we have done quite extensive research on this mutation. We test different ASO approach in different chemical modifications. So here we focus on two chemistry. One is the PMO, which is uh, the chemistry has been used in the four uh, FDA approved uh, antisense drug for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we, we know the chemistry itself is safe by systemic uh, in, uh, injection. That's what happened in Duchenne. So we test the PMO. Uh, so that's the custom group. They focus on PMO. And we, our group, we test the MOE, this chemistry. They, that one is used in the, the same chemistry as used in New Zealand. Uh, so we focus we focus on these two chemistry and we show in cultured cell uh, in cultured cells from from uh, uh, affected children so we can restore the so correct the splicing and then get the function the normal function of collagen six uh, restored so that at the cellular level and however so when we test this uh, the uh, antisense the both PMO and MOE in the humanized mouse model. So it seems the delivery to the target cell, which is the muscle, the fibroblast in muscle, the efficiency was quite low. So that linked uh, lead to the current uh, projects. So I'll talk about that later on. So apart from a little specific silencing ASO or siRNA approach and uh, the also, and also axon skipping approach, the so Kasten and the Cecilia's lab in Spain they also developed this 
gene editing approach. That's also to do a little specific silencing, to silence the so design this CRISPR, use CRISPR-Cas9 technology to silence the mutant mutant copy. So they also show that what this approach work quite well in cell culture. So now we talk about the delivery and we found that the, to target uh, the muscle fibroblast is quite challenging in uh, collagen 6 CMD when we test this in, v in the mouse model. That's because I went on his, his uh, as, as we know, for collagen 6 CMD, the administration of drug need to be systemic because it affects the whole muscle. So by systemic injection, and the most antisense that will go to 40 to 50 percent will go to liver, and then another 18 to 40 percent will be will be cleaned out by kidney. Actually, after the after the two organs, liver and kidney, and there's not much left for muscle. And also in muscle, it's not the whole muscle fiber, not like DMD, the whole muscle fibers, and actually it's the fiber, the particular fibroblast or uh, progenitor or FAP uh, is a fibro, uh, the uh, uh, fibro progenitor cell. So it's a very small group of uh, uh, cell type we need to target. So that's another study from Carson Group. They culture the, the muscle fiber and also fibroblast. This is co-culture show. Actually, it's a, it's a fibroblast which produce collagen. Uh, collagen is not the muscle fiber. So we know which particular cell type we need to target. So based on that, uh, we uh, develop a new method to develop um, to we we want to find uh, so we check the cell surface receptor and then compare the compare the fibroblast to any other cell type myoblast and also other liver cell kidney cell and we found a particular receptor on fibroblast surface and then we designed the ligand peptide a short ligand peptide which can bind to the receptor so we and then we put the light the short ligand peptide with our antisense we wanted that and then we walk so this is what we wanted to do is the so the short ligand peptide can carry the, the ASO fragment and, and bind particular specifically to fibroblasts and get inside the cell do the job. So we call this a peptide conjugated antisense approach. So that's what we are doing now. And then the project is going well. We've identified uh, so two uh, peptide candidate. Currently, we focus on one. So you can see this is a summer, a summer, I mean, yeah, the images from the lab. So we treated, we, this is a very short peptide with a uh, fluorescent tag. And so you can see, you can see the peptide is green. So we put the peptide inside uh, to the cultured medium with the, with the cultured fibroblast. And then, so you can see after five minutes, very quick, after five minutes, the cell already showed the green. So it's positive, the, um, the fluorescent uh, peptide already uh, get inside of the cell and it lasts about 45 minutes and disappear. Uh, that's just the one. And we have a screen, lots of peptide, and they found the two leaves. This is the one, uh, five, and three. Cells. We also test different other type of uh, cell, for example, liver cell and kidney cell, because we don't want our peptide to uh, be absorbed by those type of cell. So that's what we are doing now. The project is going well, and then so it's a, and also we created this large international collaboration from the UCL side and also with the Constance Group at NIH, and also the Tedesco uh, Professor Severo Tedesco's group at Crick. So we were we test this conjugate peptide conjugated the ASO and test in. Uh, uh, fibroblasts from cho affected children, and also in this 3D uh, muscle culture. That's because this is a peptide is uh, uh, specific, uh, specific so, but, and then, so we need to test the, 
actually ta yeah, it targets this one, three target both human and the mouse. So we test in 3D scalp muscle culture, which is very close to uh, in the to affected children, and also in this humanized mouse model. So, um, this is uh, the funding we got this funding, uh, very generous funding support from MDUK and the Life Arc and also collaboration with NATA. So this is a RNA therapy approach. Another one we also start uh, developing is AV gene therapy. As you know, this approach has been used in quite a lot of different other neuromuscular disorder, for example, SMA and uh, Duchenne. So for collagen sakes, because it's the AV approach, that is a pro that is a limitation is a capacity. So they cannot put we can't put a large gene. It need to be a small gene. So the the three uh, collagen six A gene the size, two of them is too big, A3 too big, and A1, the size is also too big for A1, but the A1 is A2, which is uh, smaller, so that is uh, possible for A1 uh, uh, gene therapy, and also what we can also do is we can use A1 and put the short ASO in, so to do, for example, this is the axon skipping, still the axon skipping, so this is the, the in red, this is the two uh, possible approach we can develop using a gene therapy. So that part has been, is now developing in Costan's lab, and we have a very talented, talented PhD, joint PhD student between NIH uh, and UCL. Fadi, uh, Fadi will, uh, will join our, uh, uh, our group very soon in the next two months from NIH, and he will spend the one year here to develop this AV gene therapy for, for collagen 6 DMD. So here is, uh, I summarize what uh, we have done. So we, um, we know RNA therapy is, is promising in, for collagen 6 related to CMD, and we have uh, testing different approaches, uh, quite a lot, a little specific silencing using SIRNA, using antisense, axon skipping ASO, and also gene and uh, uh, gene editing or RNA editing, and also a way gene therapy. However, all this study currently is still, is still at preclinical development stage. None of them have been moved to clinical trial, but that's what we are working on. And also at the same time, we need to develop a new approach, a new chemistry, and also the new delivery system, like the peptide conjugated system I should just show you, so to enhance the efficacy in the future when we test the, uh, in the uh, animal model. And also we realize that international effort is definitely needed to promote the development and also the clinical translation, especially the, and also another thing is the regulatory approval for this noble experimental therapy. It's uh, particular, if, so many of uh, the approach will be personalized because we have very small, uh, patient population. It's not like a large uh, SMA trial or not. So it's mutation specific, it's a small uh, patient's group. So I would like to stop here and I'll offer, uh, I'll better, th thanks our families and children and also MDUK for all the, all your support. This is very crucial, crucial for our research. Thank you very much for your commitment and also the UCL team and uh, our international coll uh, collaborators working on uh, uh, this topic. Thank you very much. I stop here and happy to take questions. Thanks, Haiyan. A really interesting talk and a really nice coverage of the different types of therapies that that may well be coming through for collagen six related dystrophies. And we do have a question in chat. Um, I think this, the the question is quite specific, but perhaps we broaden it out about a bit. Um, the question uh, is interested in um specific therapies for 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 a particular mutation and i guess bro broadly speaking there's a confusion uh, there's a, a a broad array of different therapies that are, are coming through here um i mean they they talk here about a particular mutation for um glycine to arginine at, at um, position 287 um but I guess broadly the question is how how will 
um, clinicians be deciding on which mutations are going to be targeted by which therapies? And uh, uh, are we ultimately talking about combinations of therapies further down the line? At this moment, based on the the feature of uh, so I'm talking about RNA therapy, and uh, because RNA therapy the design is currently is based on the different type of uh, mutation that approach. So it is uh, uh, mutation specific, but at the same at the same time we also develop thinking about uh, to target the common polymerase, for example, allele specific silencing. Another common we can we were thinking to develop as a common approach instead of instead of targeting the specific mutation. For example, here is uh, the. Uh, C2G, uh, uh, G2A 859. So we can target some common SNP. So it's a poly, uh, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. So to develop uh, still uh, allele specific silencing, but it will not target particular mutation, it target the common SNP. In that case, we can uh, make it uh, broader, the application uh, broader. So that's another approach we are working on. And for combine and uh, Another approach, uh, gene therapy, it will not be um, it will not be mutation specific. So if it works, that can cover uh, lots of uh, lots of function uh, mutation uh, conditions. And, and in, in the interests of time, um, I, I won't ask lots of questions, but perhaps you could comment on the liver accumulation. And you were mentioning that um, uh, ASOs possibly forty to fifty percent of those accumulate in the liver. Are there are there ways of looking at um, reducing that accumulation in liver and perhaps making the delivery to muscle more effective? Yes, that's the current uh, uh, peptide conjugated project. So with the peptide we designed is uh, they don't uh, they will not target to uh, the liver cell, for example. The, particular uh, liver, hepatic uh, cell, it's a hepat hepatocyte. So it will say it's because on hepatocyte, that, that receptor, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't exist in hepatocyte, but hepatocyte is a major cell type in liver, which got, I mean, uh, metabolizes the ASO, and sometimes uh, the liver toxicity is also from uh, hepatocyte. So in that case, we can reduce the exposure of liver to ASO and also reduce the potential toxicity at the same time. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to move on because uh, we we, uh, we need to move on to uh, Sam now. Thank you very much um, for this very interesting talk, Haiyan. Um, I'm now going to introduce Sam um, Donald, who's the project manager at John Walton Muscular Dystrophy Research Centre in Newcastle. Uh, Sam coordinates the Global Registry for Col 6 Related Dystrophies, which is an international patient registry collecting data from both affected individuals, their families and their doctors. The aim of the registry is to support research into collagen 6 related dystrophies and to help us better understand those conditions. So, um, Sam, uh, welcome. Um, please uh, take it away. Thanks very much, John, and thanks for the opportunity to share the, the work of the registry. I will just um, figure out how to share my slides. Can anybody see that presentation now? Yeah. Perfect. So as John mentioned, I'm Sam. I'm the coordinator for the Global Registry for Collagen 6 Related Dystrophies. And the registry was set up and is coordinated by the John Walton Centre in Newcastle um, at Newcastle University. The registry is funded by MDUK and has been approved by an NHS Research Ethics Committee. So I'll start by talking, uh, covering what we're going to talk about today. So I'll talk first about what is a patient registry why a patient registry is important, particularly in the context of the collagen 6 dystrophies, what does a patient registry do, how might you benefit from joining, what would you need to do if you did decide to join, and then finally, how to join if you're interested in taking part. So first, um, I'll talk briefly about what is a patient registry. 
So patient registries are large centralized databases that collect data from individuals with a specific health condition. And of course, in our case, as the name suggests, that's anyone with a collagen six related dystrophy. So the data uh, collected varies between different registries, but generally, and for the collagen six registry, we are interested in your demographics. So things like your age, ethnicity, and sex. Medical history, so that would be your diagnosis, whether you have Bethlehem myopathy, Ulrich, intermediate, etc. Any genetic testing you've had that gives details of the mutation that's causing your condition and any symptoms you might have, for example, contractures, muscle pain. And finally, we also are interested in the impact of the condition on your daily life. So this may be things like pain, um, mobility or your ability to work. Some registries, uh, such as the Collagen 6 registry, also collect data from their participants at regular periods over time. Um, and we call this longitudinal data collection. So by measuring how your condition changes over time or how its impact on your life might change, um, the registry can help us better understand the progression of the Collagen 6 related conditions. So... Um, why are patient registries important? So I've added this image here, which was produced by Genomics in England, and I've added it to try and help us understand the role of patient registries in rare disease. And amongst other things, this image shows us that whilst there are diseases that are individually rare, like the collagen 6 related dystrophies, when we count those people together, they make up quite a large population. An example of this is that in the UK, there are 3.5 million people with a rare disease. So individually rare, but together, not so rare. And we know that the collagen 6 related dystrophies are a very rare condition. Um, some research that was done into the prevalence of uh, both Ulrich uh, congenital muscular dystrophy and Bethlehem myopathy found uh, in Northern England, the prevalence was about one in 100,000 people. So because of this relative rareness, an individual clinic or an individual um, doctor may only see a handful of people with a collagen 6 related diagnosis. So it's quite difficult for that individual to have an accurate picture of all the different ways in which these conditions can present the different symptoms that might affect people. But by bringing together data from these individuals, not only nationally, but internationally with our registry, we hope that we can help build a more accurate picture of these conditions. So I've said here that the strength of the patient registry and, and registries in general is their ability to bring together large numbers of people with rare conditions like collagen 6 dystrophies. And we can also use registries to drive research and improve our understanding of a condition's natural history. Um, so on this slide, um, I've just wanted to show the current number of participants on the global registry so that you can see the efforts that we're making to bring together those individually rare people into a large unified group. So you can see that we currently have 278 individuals enrolled on the registry, and that's internationally. But given the estimated prevalence of the conditions, as we mentioned previously, I think we would expect to see at least 600 individuals in the UK alone. So of course, it's going to be very challenging for us to enroll every single person, but there's clearly a lot more people that we can try and reach with the registry to be more representative of the entire community. So I've mentioned the importance of patient registries uh, in rare conditions um, and how they're sort of important in supporting research and understanding. But I now want to give a few more specific examples of the ways in which this registry uh, and the data that we collect can be used. So as an example, uh, researchers may contact the registry to request use of the data that we've collected from our participants. If it's approved by our steering committee, which I'll talk a little bit more about soon, um, the request for anonymous data, can, we can share this data with the researcher so that they can do their analysis and perform research. And here I've just shown two um, examples of previous times where data collected on the collagen 6 registry was used to support research. Um, the first example here is um, in a study looking at quality of life in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So that would be from our participants with a diagnosis of Bethlehem myopathy. And the second one was looking at um, outcomes of pregnancy and birth with people with um, neuromuscular conditions. So it's just to try and show you some of the ways in which the data can be used. Uh, another key use of the registry can be to inform our participants um, and support recruitment to research studies. So we can do this by sharing the information with everybody in the registry to make them aware, or if there's certain criteria that's needed for somebody to become eligible for the study, we can try and identify those individuals and, and sort of invite them personally. 
Um, another thing that we try to do with the registry is, is not only to provide data to the research and clinical community, but to try and support patients and families in making their voice and their story heard and informing these research and clinical communities about the issues that are most important to those affected. Um, to kind of try and illustrate this point about the importance of data collection to the empowerment of people living with rare disease, I wanted to briefly touch on this report that was published by Genetic Alliance UK on Rare Disease Day this year. So Genetic Alliance UK, for those who might not know, is the UK's largest alliance of organisations of people um, uh, supporting people with rare and genetic conditions. In the past, and, and still is the case, much of the work done by Genetic Alliance has focused on sharing the stories of people affected by rare conditions to raise awareness with public and healthcare professionals, which of course is very important. However, in this report, they sort of reverse the approach and emphasize the importance of the statistics that are behind these stories, whilst of course remembering that each data point has a person behind it. So, I've just shared on this slide um, the summary of the stats behind the stories report and which sort of touches on why it's important that we have this data. But I think from the perspective of the registry, what's important to take away from the report is that without us collecting data from people with these rare conditions, we can't properly understand their importance or understand the services or support that people with these conditions might need. And the patient registry has been on, uh, or patient registries in general, a long established way of collecting this data. So I think that we can have an important role to play in continuing to support these data collection efforts. Um, before I talk about um, how the registry can try to support clinical trials, uh, I think it's important just to highlight again that there's currently no clinical trials for the collagen six dystrophies. So this is kind of um, how we're trying to support clinical trials that might come around in, in future. And a general way that we can do this um, is support and recruitment. As we mentioned for other research studies, we can make people aware that there's trials in their area that have opened, or we can try and identify specific individuals who, based on the data that they've provided us, might be eligible to participate in a trial. Um, and when I talk about clinical trial readiness, um, <laughs> What we're trying to do is establish a large group of individuals who we know have a confirmed collagen 6 diagnosis, are interested in research, and we have some data about their condition. Um, and our kind of hope is that by having this, um, this cohort, we can support what we call clinical trial readiness, try to encourage innovation in this area and, and for companies to try and um, develop trials for people with collagen 6 conditions. And if trials do start, the process will hopefully um, be a lot quicker and smoother because we have a large number of people who are sort of ready to go and, and interested in taking part in that research. So now I'll touch on some of the ways um, that you might benefit from joining the registry, aside from sharing your data with us to try and further, further research. Um, if you're a participant on the registry, we'll share um, relevant news and developments from the research community. Um, and as part of this, we have a, a registry newsletter that we send out twice a year but I also regularly share articles and news from other sources with, with the participants. Um, as I've mentioned a little bit previously, um, I share I try to share any relevant research studies that are recruiting participants um, with the people on the registry. And sometimes researchers might directly approach a registry to help with their recruitment to research. And as I've kind of mentioned, um, we kind of our hope is that the registry can act as a way for the patient community to have their voice heard. And this can be done by completing the registry questionnaires and providing your data. But we also want the registry to act um, in support of patient advocacy, particularly working alongside groups like MD UK. So if you decided to join, what would you actually need to do? So um, first you would need to head to our website, which is www.collagen6.org. After you create an account on the uh, registry portal on the website, you will be presented with an online consent form to complete. And then after consenting, you'll be asked a series of questionnaires that, as I've mentioned, would relate to your diagnosis, any impact on your health and quality of life that it might have. Um, parents or guardians of, of children who have a, a collagen 6 related dystrophy can also input data. So once you've set up your own account, you would be asked if you're entering data for yourself or, or for somebody else, and then you'll be given a consent form um, as appropriate. Um, 
And apart from providing your name, the date of birth and sex and email address, which we need to complete the registration, um, you can then provide as little or as much data as you feel comfortable to do so. So it's all it's all optional. Um, and following your registration and the first point at which you enter data, you would be asked to you'll be sent a reminder annually to ask you to update any changes or or complete new questionnaires. Um, and from time to time, I, I could be in touch with you to ask um, for clarification about certain things. But I think it's important to say, again, this is still all, all optional. You can provide whatever data you feel comfortable. Um, I think it's important as well to show you how access to your data is managed. Um, and to do this, we have our steering committee. So before any data is shared with a, a interested researcher, the request is first reviewed by our registry steering committee. And you can see the members of our steering committee on this slide. And essentially, it's a panel of both clinical and research experts, representatives from patient organisations, as well as affected individuals and family members. They would review the request to use the data that's been collected by the registry and check that it meets the aims and goals of the registry, which is that it will potentially benefit the Collagen 6 community. And most importantly, that the way in which the data is going to be used respects the privacy of our participants. And we never share any data that could be used to identify you outside of the, the registry team here at the Newcastle, the Newcastle uh, John Walton Centre. Um, so I guess the final point is if you wanted to join or you want to learn more, you can head to our website, which I've mentioned is www.collagen6.org. Um, these QR codes as well should take you to the website. And if you have any more questions, please feel free to email me. The email address is there, which is collagen6registry at newcastle.ac.uk. That's also on our website if you wanted to ask any questions or clarifications. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about the registry. Um, happy to take any questions. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come in on the chat. Um, I think you've probably at least partially covered this question with some, some, somebody saying, uh, uh, um, uh, when you get to the stage of patient trials, how do they find a suitable patient? I mean, I suppose from the perspective of somebody doing a clinical trial, how do they how do they contact you and what kind of patients do they do they get out of the registry? Yes, I think it's for the collagen six registry, it will of course be be new ground, but our general approach is in two ways that we will if a trial opens to recruitment, we would inform all our participants um straight away without necessarily being um a request coming from whoever is sponsoring that clinical trial. But we're also trying to establish, um, and, and this isn't just an effort led by this registry, but, but patient registries in rare disease in general, as a kind of first point of contact for um, people who are developing clinical trials to ensure that they are kind of having an equitable access for people to, to enroll in clinical trials. Um, so... I think there's a kind of an aim that we would be a sort of a first point of contact for companies when they want to open to recruitment, they would send a request to the registry and we would identify um, the appropriate people who might be eligible um, and, you know, give them the opportunity to, to take part. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, I, I have another question from, uh, oh, I think actually maybe a, few other questions have come in bear with me um i i have a question from somebody who um is not sure whether they're on the on the registry at all and um, do you do you usually send out emails to your um regular emails to your participants and um can they contact you on that email address that they put you put up earlier yes i think that would probably be the easiest way if, if you're not sure if you're on the registry and, and you contact me i i can check um, and let you know. Um, but if you were on the registry, I mean, we sort of send out correspondence, I would say at least every two weeks. So unless, um, if you haven't been receiving emails, it, it might be unlikely that you were registered. Right, thank you. Uh, somebody else is asking here, um, are clinicians asked to promote the registry to their to their patients? I mean, ob obviously, um, clinicians are busy 
treating people and uh, I, I'm aware that there's a, an additional burden there but how do you, how do doctors get involved in in this process? I think um, there's kind of two approaches to this and um, and maybe Anna can can speak to this as well but we've been trying to I guess have as a standard practice to include um, a simple sentence that that says you might be interested that there's a patient registry recruiting people with your condition and we were trying to add that to both um, genetic test result reports and to clinic letters from um, neuromuscular centers um i think with the variation between different centers um i don't think we've managed to do that universally yet but it's something that we're working on and the other kind of side of it is that when you join the registry um you have the opportunity to name your doctor to ask them to provide some further data on your behalf so that's kind of another way that we um we communicate with with doctors um we ask them to participate in the registry and to provide data um, but as you say there's there's obviously challenges with capacity for people to do that so um yeah we're looking at ways to try and simplify that process um and we're hoping that when we have a new a new online platform for the registry that will simplify things a bit further Fantastic. Um, I have a question that I'm sorry to say is not in English, and um, we, we we will attempt to uh, translate this and get back to you by by email. Um, a, another question from Rory that is saying thank you. Um, I just checked that we're registered, but you uh, but not receiving comms every two weeks i think for, for for some of these questions we'll uh we'll try and get back to um people by email uh, a bit later um i'm aware that we've missed uh one or two questions related to the collagen six um uh, talk that Haiyan gave and uh, we'll also try and re respond to those by email um perhaps one one final question from me for you, Sam, which sure. is about generally um, putting information into registries, and I, I guess from a from a, a, a an ordinary person in the street perspective, it seems like a very straightforward thing to design a registry. Um, perhaps you can comment more broadly on why there are so many different registries and. Um, what efforts there might be to harmonize those and what the challenges are. Yeah, I think that's a very good point that um, registries are set up with different intentions. In the case of the Collagen 6 registry, it was to try and establish this cohort of people so that we can try and support clinical trial readiness. But other registries might be developed because somebody has a particular research question or they just want to understand how common the condition is. So it's kind of each registry has its own goals and the data that they collect reflects those goals. But as you say, John, there are now efforts to harmonize this data. So that's basically saying, I have a registry that collects data from neuromuscular patients. There could be one somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the UK. How can we work together? And I think a big part of that is making sure that we collect the same data from people and that we collect the data in the same way so that we can compare. Um, and there's an organization which is Treat, Treat NMD who have a registries network and they have developed a set of what they call core data sets. And this is essentially a, a set of questions and a way to collect those questions that they encourage you to implement in different registries so that those, those data are comparable. Um, but I think it's also a challenge for example, I know that the, the um, QSCMD registry, which is the Congenital Muscle Disease International Registry, also recruits people with um, collagen 6 related dystrophy. So we're working closely with them to try and reduce the burden on people so that they're not having to enter the same data twice in different places. Um, but yeah, it's a work in progress. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, I'm going to bring the research session to a close. Um, thank you for both of the uh, uh, both the speakers in this session. Um, 
I just want to reiterate that if we've missed some questions, we're going to endeavour to get back to you by email later. So please don't feel that we've um, ignored your questions. Um, and uh, I'm now going to hand back to Nero for the next session. Thank you, Nero. Thank you, John, and thank you, everyone, who's just spoken and answered some questions. So um, we'll now move on to the session about living with college and six related neuromuscular conditions. So I'm delighted to welcome our three panelists today who will be joining Sam McDonald and will help us to discuss and answer your questions. So we're going to be joined today by Dr. Anna Sarkozy, Dr. Matthew Hurley, Natalie Smith and Nick Emery. So I will introduce each speaker and then I'll invite each of them to make a few remarks about their experience of supporting with people living with collagen six related conditions and to raise some key points about managing or living with the condition. And as I've mentioned at the beginning of the cinema, of the seminar even, we will be covering as many questions as we can that have been submitted in advance. We'll also be using the Q&A function, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. So please type in your question or comments and we'll feed, try and feed them into the discussion. And as John said, any questions that we don't manage to cover, we'll answer directly after the seminar. So if I can just introduce our speakers first. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Anna Sarkozy. So Anna's a neuromuscular consultant working at the Neuromuscular Centre at Great Ormond Street Hospital with a major role in the running of the UK highly specialised Diagnostic and Advisory Service for Congenital Muscular Dystrophies and Myopathies, including collagen 6 gene-related diseases. She runs regular clinics for patients with rare neuromuscular diseases and has a major interest in better understanding the natural history of these conditions. We've also got Nick Emery. So he Nick started his career as a Royal Marine Commando and then spent 18 years in the London Fire Service. He attended Keele University and qualified in 2005. He then worked at the Neuromuscular Centre at Winsford in the July of the same year. Nick moved to the um, Robert John Agnes Hunt Orthopaedic Hospital in 2009, initially working with Professor Quinn Levin, now with Professor Willis and Dr. Kulshartha and a fantastic team. The team were looking up the team there look after approximately 100, uh, 1,200 patients, both paediatric and adult. Nick is not involved in the clinical work. Nick is not only involved in the clinical work, but also has a role in both pharmaceutical, clinical, interventional research. We're also delighted to be joined by Natalie Smith. Natalie is a clinical nurse specialist at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Natalie graduated in children's nursing in 2015. And after six months of general children's nursing practice at King's College Hospital, she moved to Great Ormond Street Hospital, where she worked as a, uh, as a cardiac intensive care nurse, a bank senior nurse for the nurse-led sedation unit and a bank nurse for the paediatric neonatal and cardiac intensive care units. Um, Natalie joined the neuromuscular team at Great Ormond Street Hospital in 2017 as a clinical nurse specialist. In her current role, she manages a very clinically complex caseload of children with neuromuscular conditions from diagnosis throughout their treatment journey with a focus on procedural anxiety and patient family involvement. And then finally, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Matthew Hurley. Dr. Hurley is a respiratory pediatrician in Nottingham. He's involved in the treatment of children and young people throughout the East Midlands as part of the respiratory and long-term ventilation teams. He has a research interest in lung infection, particularly in those with neurodisability and neuromuscular conditions. So thank you all for joining us today. 
So I wonder if I could now come to each of you to just say a few words about your involvement with these conditions and living well with the conditions. Dr. Sarkozy, can I come to you first? Yes, for sure. <clears throat> Apologies, I have a bit of a cause. I hope you can hear me fine. But um, I, 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 perhaps uh, the few comments I wanted to make to start the discussion is that um, just to give a few key points I think are important when we talk about clinical management of uh, young and, and adults with collagen 6 related diseases. So these are rare diseases, but I agree with what Sam was saying that probably while we are these individually are rare, they are not as, as rare altogether. So, and, and often it's very important that the, the patients are identified and have received a correct diagnosis. So really management starts from right diagnosis. So I think it's, first of all, it's very important that everybody who has a possible collagen six related disease has a correct genetic diagnosis and definition, not only of the gene that is involved, but also of the specific gene change. And you heard from Hayan's talk how this is important for possible and novel therapies. So that's really the first. Having a genetic diagnosis will help you to also reach out the right registry and be enrolled in possible, you know, uh, uh, patient communities that will help um, yourself and your family. The second thing is that having a strong link with a good neuromuscular center, and in, in terms of good, in terms of neuromuscular center, who is a, your local specialist center for patients with neuromuscular diseases, being this in a pediatric or adult setting. So I would strongly recommend that everyone is regularly seen um, on, on a regular basis in a neuromuscular center, where there also are strict links with the specialists who need to be part of the multidisciplinary care of patients in particular with respiratory consultants, physiotherapists, orthopedic team, and so on. And um, having a holistic care where also specialist nurses are, have, play a very important role. This is really important because I think um, in order to have a good care in absence of a therapy at the moment, it's really important that we have a good management of all the aspects that are um, important in this condition. So it's really important to make sure everything is covered. Um, and I think following standards of care is very important. And this also makes patients with this condition trial ready. And there will be a disease uh, modifying therapy available. Uh, patients who follow standards of care will be probably in the optimal position to take part in possible studies. I think this was just to give you an intro, I really. I don't know if this is sufficient. Thank you, Anna. That you've made some really important points, and that's really helpful. Um, we did have a question in advance that, if I may, I can ask you now. It was quite a general question, to be fair, and it was to do with the difference between. So, could you explain how Bethlem myopathy and Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy differ from each other? It was a question we had in last week. Yes, you have to. For, I think first it was important to remember that some of this terminology nomenclature come when we didn't know as much about genetics of some conditions. We understand now that these conditions are part of a spectrum, all caused by changes in one of these three genes, and depending on how much the change affects the function and the production of the proteins and this, uh, um, and this filamentous protein, the collagen, um, you have different range of severities and problems of patients may face. Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy is the name that we use for that presentation that is often present at birth and children with this condition may present symptoms very early on in first years of life. And there, and there's, and and when we have the genetic diagnosis of collagen six related disease that has early onset, with a range of symptoms are defined within the nomenclature of Ulrich congenital muscular dystrophy. Um, there are some mutations that more often associate with this presentation. Then there are people who usually has a slightly milder presentation, more often with less severe motor involvement and less severe respiratory involvement. And those patients would have a diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis with Bethlehem myopathy. Again, there might be some changes that are more common in that presentation 
there are some people who are in between. Sometimes people with this presentation may be called really an intermediate phenotype. Thank you, Anna. Um, just for our panelists, if you would, I'm asking specific questions directed to people, but if you would like to add anything, do come off of mute and do that. That's absolutely fine. So if we can now move on, um, Dr. Hurley, can we come to you now just to say a few words? Yeah, morning. Um, I think I'm the representative from the sticks. Um, so, and, and for all, all the reasons that Sam has described, um, for, for folk who have a, a, a rare condition in any one clinic, there may be a, a, a small uh, number of, of, of folk with that individual condition. Um, and, and also, I think we're describing conditions, as Anna's described, with huge variability. So it's very difficult to um, describe very general comments. But I think, um, but from my perspective, um, having strategies to identify problems as and when they occur is, is hugely important. As Anna said, um, folk being seen in a, in a neuromuscular clinic, um, whereby um, surveillance on a, on a regular basis is, is undertaken. Um, and it's a, it's a, uh, a care for, these, for, for folk with these conditions, um, exemplifies the multidisciplinary um, bit. And I'm, and I'm going to hesitate I'm not going to list all the multi-professionals who were involved because I'm bound to forget forget a group, um, but but that's critical. Um, and I suppose as as respiratory pediatricians um, and uh, and my adult colleagues as well, um, we're interested in um, respiratory muscle weakness. And so the the adequacy of the respiratory pump to achieve two things really: um, adequacy of airway clearance and cough. And I don't want to say too much more because I, I won't worry. I'm going to. Um, steal some of what Nick's going to describe, and then the adequacy of breathing and, and sleep. So essentially, um, folk can function as, as optimally as they can um, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and achieve all those things that, um, that folk want to do. I, 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 don't, I don't know how much more you wanted me to... That's absolutely fine. We have got a respiratory focused question that came in advance, but what I will do is let Nick say a few words first and then I can come to the both of you to answer that question. Nick, can we come to you next, please? Yeah, hi. Um, so from my experience working with Ulrichs or, or, the, or the College in Six, um, spectrum and it is a spectrum as Anna so rightly said that that from the early onset it's, it's very much about management management about the contractures which are extremely difficult to manage um because of that that, that lack of that collagen six protein um that they tend to get contractures at elbows knees and hips very readily um and because they're not ambulant from a very early age tend to be seated for a long time and you can you can introduce the best stretching program in the world, but it's not going to make a huge deal of difference. Um, and you also have that laxity distally. So sometimes there can be that added weakness within the hands, which is also quite a challenge. Um, and then moving further along. So the intermediate, you're going to still be managing that contraction management could be something you need to do. So we're very lucky. We've got a fantastic orthotics department. We can get something called contraction correction devices, which are devices which will passively or actively stretch your muscle um, and they can be left on for up to an hour and they're really good at stretching knees um, and elbows but we can't do anything for hips so introducing of a standing frame at that stage might be something we could think about and further down the line with Bethlehem we're probably looking at sort of an exercise more related program to try and maintain that strength around hips in particular um, and then and then also that respiratory element um, is, is carrying out the um, FVC, functional um, functional vital capacity and FEV. So looking at how strong the lungs are on a peak cough flow to make sure they're an adequate cough that they people can clear. And if they haven't, then we can refer, refer, refer to our, our um, respiratory colleagues. And I think that's where physiotherapy lies in a in a very good place that we are then able to signpost people to the the the, the appropriate uh, care um and also wheelchair management um trying to get good wheelchairs good con good seating um and moving away from that looking at ot referrals so that homes can be adapted and also having links with our clinical nurse specialists and also ot colleagues 
So I think that's where the role of physiotherapists it lies in the in the management of collagen six uh, disorders. Thank you, Nick. That's really, really helpful. So the question we had, the respiratory related question, you partly answered it, but um, it was quite a standardized question. So how often should respiratory function be monitored if a person is at risk of respiratory difficulties? So I'm assuming this is someone that's not had respiratory issues but just needs to be monitored so how often would that be do you think so, so, shall i, I start off nick, either of you. I'll, I'll start <laughs> off nick and then you can um so so i suppose the, the question is, is 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 what monitoring should be done um mm, and yeah. and there's there's a large amount of um different ways in which um measurements can be made to understand the strength of the respiratory pump and how well that's that's working um, and so lung function, so the um, um, maneuver that, that Nick was describing, the um, breathing in and out hard and fast to empty all your lungs into a, into a machine who can measure the flow and the amount of air described, um, spirometry, um, and then other respiratory muscle testing. So uh, sniff um, strength, cough strength, um, and maximal inspiratory and expiratory flow. Um, and then... Uh, that's on, on in, in terms of how well you you can expectorate cough, how um, how well you can clear your chest of debris, um, and then how well your the, the pump is at managing um, adequate breathing. And initially, that's um, mostly identified as a problem in sleep, and particularly in phases of deep sleep, um, and sleep that's not particularly refreshing. Um, and so, overnight studies of of breathing and sleep can be useful there. Um, I would suspect the most folk are, are seen in a clinic annually or six monthly, um, and would expect that, that lung function and some of those measurements be be done as part of that. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick, anything to add? Yeah, you know, every, every time the patient would come to clinic, they'd have a, a respiratory function test, but with also additionally, we'd be asking questions, how many chest infections you had over the last six to to eight months have they have they involved any admissions to hospital and if that pattern changes that might indicate that they've got some respiratory problems also have their sleep pattern have their sleep habits changed so if they are they sleeping with more pillows so if they sleep, sleep having to sleep more upright that might indicate they've got a bit of a problem and also with early morning headaches if they start to get early morning headaches that's a big warning sign refer to, to respiratory colleagues for an overnight, overnight uh, sleep study Perhaps I also just wanted to mention that um, generally, even for patients who are not yet under respiratory care or not yet seen by a respiratory doctor, although in patients with collagen 6, we try to do this very early on. But yes, yeah, so, so as, as Matthew has rightly said, at least every 6 to 12 months, it's a general patient would be seen and we would do FVC in clinic and PICO flow. Um, and I just wanted to mention that for, for families, so there are uh, family guides available for co congenital muscular dystrophy. It's not yet specific for collagen six, but hopefully in future something like this will be developed. And this 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 sort of guidance about what are the standards of monitoring, their information included about the frequency of how often uh, these tests should be done, roughly. Okay, thank you, Anna, and thank you, Nick, and. Um... Dr. Hurley, um, just there was a question about standards of care, which I will briefly go to because you've mentioned it before I move on to um, letting um, Natalie just say a few words. And there are quite a few questions coming in, so I don't think we'll get to all of them, but we'll do as much as we can. So there was a, connect, a question by an anonymous attendee. Are the standards of care standardized across the UK and can they be shared with patients? 
So perhaps I can quickly comment on this. So, so the standards of, there are no specific standards of only for collagen six, but there are those for conjunctive muscular dystrophies and these are available. And there is a family guide that is, um, has been um, drafted based on these international standards of care, which is available freely on the Treat and MD website. Maybe we can put it in the chat later on for people to use. Um, and this family guide, gives uh, families and people with collagen 6 disease information about what are the recommendations for standards of care. Um, how to standardize this through in the UK? That's a more complex question, but, but generally doctors who are involved in neuromuscular field and know about this condition usually are aware of the standards of care. And uh, we tend to follow um, as much as possible these recommendations. We, these are international standards of care. Some, some type of management might be different in some countries, but we generally tend to follow the standards of care. Thank you, Anna. Um, anyone else would like to add anything to that question? No. Right, can I now finally, sorry about this, move on to Natalie, so Natalie can say a few words. Thank you, Natalie. Hi from Great Ormond Street um, hold up with a cold so apologies as well if I'm coughing or sniffing and um, I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists for the neuromuscular team and um, quite aptly I've been put after all of the other professionals um, it's been really good to hear about the research that's come in and the potential combination of therapies because I think for those with rare mutations to have some hope that there might be something that could slightly improve things um, is, is really nice um, and it was really nice to hear from Sam about the patient registry um, and I think it's important to mention that and everything else that everyone else has spoken about the respiratory side of things the joint contractures the neuromuscular appointments because when you have a rare disease it, it is a multi-system um, thing and there's lots of things to think about at all different points of a uh, patient's journey and my role really as a CNS is to help people think about what to prioritize at the right time, um, whilst also being proactive in looking forward. Um, because as Anna said, the standards of care there and when treatments do become available in the future, if, you've, if you're at the best standard and working towards your best potential and you know what's coming next, then hopefully you're in the best place to be on top of things and have a good quality of life. Um, so a lot of what we do is communication, um, and encouraging patients to join the registries and have their voice as well. Thank you, Natalie. That was really, really helpful. So we've got quite a few questions. I am going to try and ask as many as I can in batches, but do bear with me. Um, so just before we move away from respiratory, there was just a follow up question about respiratory care so um i'm having a respiratory review annually but have been discharged from the clinic should i be pushing to be referred for regular review now there's you probably need more information it's not your patients so if you could generally answer that or we can go back to them afterwards Shall I go first and then others can correct me as I'm, um, I, I think in the first instance, um, having an open discussion with your, with the, the colleagues in your centre um, is probably what is most useful. Um, and, and then you can, but th then you know what it is that you're talking about um, and what it, they understand what it is that you're concerned about and vice versa. Um, I think as, as Nick described, that there are, there are some things that um, might um, highlight that, that, that things need to be looked at in, in more detail, either um, more infections or just the uh, effectiveness of, of cough becoming, um, becoming reduced um, and increased propensity to infection. Um, and on the other side, the qual quality of, of breathing in sleep and, and how refreshing sleep is, morning headache, morning feeling a little bit off, um, meals taking a little bit longer, um, uh, weight reducing, um, Things like that. Thank you. Um, Natalie, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to say more generally, the, the standards of care that are in place are there, but 
um, as others have said, the, the disease is stable. So it could be that you've been filtered in, in it to have a checkup of things and then things are okay. Can you guys hear me or discharged? But in between those clinic appointments have do change like my specialist services and let them know and and you can probably quite easily be re-referred and filtered to clinic. Thanks, Natalie. You know, I was um, just going to add that, that if the if the person asking that question is not under a neuromuscular specialist centre, then it's possibly that might be one of the issues that if they're not seen regularly in a neuromuscular specialist centre, then they might not be getting regular reviews of their spirometry, their breathing, and then that might be the issue. So it might be that route that, that's lacking rather than anything else going on. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, just a quick comment for um, attendees. I did see a couple of hands go up within the audience. Unfortunately, we can't take extra questions through this session. So if you do have questions, please keep submitting them through the Q&A and we will answer them after the seminar if we don't get to all of them. Thank you. Um, so we had one question in advance and it's the sort of question that we sometimes do get to our helpline and um, my helpline team aren't clinically trained, so we can't answer these questions, but I thought it might be quite useful to discuss this particular question now. So a lady has um, sent the question in, a mum, I think. She says, my daughter was recently diagnosed with this dystrophy and she complains from pain in her feet, especially the toes area. She can't stand for more than 15 minutes. Then her feet start to go numb and her skin's extremely dry and reddish with goose with like goose skin so i'm wondering are these side effects of this dystrophy and we have been asked these questions previously so would anyone like to just comment on that if i can start just a general comment i think as, as mentioned before it's very difficult to give strong medical advice on somebody you haven't seen um, without having a diagnosis at hand and uh, type of mutation, type of disease, and so on. But with collagen 6, we know that there is a skin involvement. So some type of skin changes can sometimes be seen in some people. Um, the, 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 the type of things that you mentioned, the, the dryness um, and the redness of the skin in the feet, um, it, it, it's a bit unspecific. It's very, it's, I would very be hesitant to make any strong recommendation. I think in general, something is, is something start suddenly in general as a doctor I would say always that you have to get the medical advice and you can start with your GP or your you know your particular close practitioner depending on where this person is messaging from um, and then clearly ask your neuromuscular doctor if they feel that this type of skin features are possibly associated to the disease or maybe something unrelated we also have to remember that somebody with a collagen 6 disease can have other things as well happening, you know, other type of skin problem, maybe it's skin infection or something like that. But I'm not saying that that's the issue. Regarding with pain in the feet and the toes and cannot standing, again, it's very difficult to comment without knowing if there are contractures, if there are, if this person, for example, use orthosis is very, so I think we have to be seen, seen in the context of the clinical presentation of the person. So I might struggle to say more than that, but maybe I don't know if anybody else wants to comment, maybe Nick has. Yeah, I, I think yeah, totally, yeah, totally agree with Anna. It's very difficult to be specific. Um, the only things that I would be asking is is has it changed over time? Is it a worsening, um, or is it the same? Is it always been fifteen minutes? She's only been able, they've only been able to stand for. Are they the or is the problem getting worse over time? And then just monitor it. Is it in specific time periods? How long does the pain take to settle once they've sat down? If it settles down relatively quickly, it's not too concerning. But if it lingers for hours and hours and hours, then I think they just need to to get a, a go to their the specialist doctor and get a bit more advice and and actually have some investigations or further investigations done if needed. 
Very helps only the comment I wanted to make just to say that sometimes when we talk about the rare diseases, it's often general practitioner might always think, or maybe it's related to the underlying disease, but it's very important that if there's something new, something changes, something unexpected, always go to your GP as well um, and, and liaise with your neuromuscular service for advice to understand if it's part of the condition. Thank you both for that. I think even though you can't comment, understandably, on individual cases, that a bit has been helpful to answer that question. So if we move on to some more questions, there was a question from Diane. She's asking all of you generally. Um, she wants to know about the common opinion about physical exercise for collagen six patients. Nick, is that one for yeah. you again? Yes, that's me. <laughs> there are quite a few physiotherapy-related yeah. questions. Um, again, without knowing the specifics, it's very difficult because if you've got more contractures, it's more difficult to do exercise. However, yes. doing anything is better than doing nothing. Um, so if you can, I mean, it's really difficult to get to, I think, hydrotherapy pools, if you can get one, if you can, if you can make access of it. Um, doing... I'm a great lover of an exercise bike. They're pretty boring, but they're a good form of exercise. Um, cardiovascular, so keep lung and heart working quite well. Um, I've never heard of anyone falling off them, so they're quite safe. The other options, if you can't do that, you can get floor pedals and you can use your floor pedals for your, for your feet and, and legs to get them, but you can also put them on a table and use your upper limbs. So anything that you can do just to try and do a little bit above what you would do normally be doing is good exercise. Um, for specifics in terms of trying to maintain or trying to improve strength, I think we have to be very careful there because if we are going to try and do weighted exercise, I would err on the side of caution and say that doing heavier weights is going to may, I'm going to emphasize, may lead to a, a worsening of the, of, of the condition. But doing some weighted exercise, if able, but when you feel a little bit fatigue in the muscle, that's when you stop, you rest, and then you carry on after two to three minutes. And that will vary from day to day, um, but it's important. And I, I, can't, I can't say lots of physios love this three sets of 10, and I never say three sets of 10 because I think it's an easy, it's an easy escape, just go and do three sets of 10. I, I'm going to be a bit controversial. I think it's lazy physio. And I think we've got to be very specific about this when we when we try and encourage patients to do exercise is to say it's up to you how much you do. And I know that's a bit of a cop out as well, but it's it's I don't know how that person is going to respond to that exercise. I don't know how their muscles are going to respond. I don't know what they're going to be doing. So it's erring on the side of caution, but encouraging a little bit of activity above what would be normal. Hopefully that's answered it. You have, Nick. Thank you for that. That's really, really helpful. Um, so something that we haven't covered in any detail as yet, and I wonder if some of you would be able to answer some of this. So um, are there any guidelines or recommendations around daily nutrition, diet for people with these types of conditions who are actually use wheelchairs? Um, compared to the general 2,500 calories for men versus 2,000 for women. So general answer to that, possibly. Shall I maybe start with a quick comment? Um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't think there are specific guidelines about nutrition for collagen 6 related disease that are specific. Again, in the family guide, there is a, a session on nutrition um and feeding i think it's very important in general muscular conditions to be sure that we are not underweight and people with this condition may actually have an issue about being underweight so i would be very cautious about you know having a diet that is low in calories um the, the numbers that you indicate there is for adults so clearly we have to be cautious also about feeding to feeding intake for you know caloric intake for children and adults but usually with this condition, the problem is more to be underway, also with the respiratory involvement. So um, it's just to be important, important to have a good balanced diet and avoiding being too low weight or also too heavy wouldn't be good either. 
for mindful wave management. Thank you, Anna. Um, Nick, anything to add? Yeah, I think I think if if you if you're looking at sort of the the recommend daily, you know, two thousand calories for a woman, two thousand five hundred for a man. Um, I think that that if you are in a wheelchair, then I think your your energy expenditure will go down. But as Anna said, from the from what I've seen, most of the Ulrichs I've seen have been underweight as opposed to being overweight. And I think it's a problem of making sure that there's enough calories going in, that if they do get a chest infection, they've got some reserve to be able to fight that off. It's also, if the weight is going down, whether we look at actually introducing a peg to actually get those calories in. Um, and I think that could be important. And that's not saying that the person has to stop eating. And this is always a big issue. That I don't want to peg because I'm, that means I can't eat. No, it's not meaning that. It's meaning that we can supplement your calorie intake so we maintain your weight as opposed to taking away your enjoyment of food. And that's really important. That's a really important take home there. Thank you, Nick. Um, I think it's well just, yeah, just to add, um, as the quicker that you, you act on weight loss, the better. Um, and, and as Nick said, it could just be diet, diet supplements, a few shakes, or just some really little changes to diet. Um, Adding um, and and local, you can speak to your GP and get referrals to local dietitians, or for those in pediat bigger pediatric centres, speak to the neuromuscular team. But there's a lot can be done, and early early intervention is key, and um, especially when it comes to the being a bit older and really needing that reserve when you've got more respiratory issues going on, and Thank potentially you. needing surgeries in the future. Nutrition is very important. Thank you, Natalie. That's really, really helpful. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we've got a couple of questions, one in advance and one on the Q&A about um, scoliosis. So um, the one in the Q&A is any comments about monitoring treatment for possible development of scoliosis? And I'm just going to also go to the question that came in advance on that. Um, what advice can you offer about postural management, particularly in relation to monitoring scoliosis? That one's open to anyone. Nick? <laughs> um, so, so yes, scoliosis is an issue. Um, so we would in clinic look at the spine in sitting and in standing if able. If we see a, a curve, we will get a, a baseline x-ray, get the angle measured, and then at each appointment, we will then monitor it. But at the start of the curve, we will also refer to a spinal surgeon so that they can be have an earlier um so that they can monitor the spine as well and at a point whether they would then need to do surgery if there is a curve developing i will also refer to orthotics to get a spinal jacket um, which can help reduce the speed the curve develops at it's not probably going to stop it developing and then there's also if they're in a wheelchair it's having really good postural management in the wheelchair um, and also frequent position changes um, and the other option, uh, the other caution to have that with that is making sure that hip flexion contractures, if they do develop, are equal rather than asymmetric. So if you develop an asymmetric hip flexion contracture, so one hip becomes more contracted than the other, you can get a rotational element within the scoliosis, which adds the complexity to if there's going to be spinal surgery needed in the future. So quite a lot of management around scoliosis, uh, but it's it's monitoring and early interventions if possible. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, anyone have anything else to add to that? No? Okay. Um, let me just, I believe a new question's come in and we've got a couple of other questions and comments. Um, Oh, this was back to do with nutrition and digestion. So my son's been diagnosed with Ulrich last year. He's on the milder end, they've said. And they were wondering if it's normal with this condition to be able to to be unable to eat in a lot a lot in one sitting. 
Um, she says, my son is is sick frequently after big meals. And I was thinking, could it be to slow digestion? My apologies for getting my words all muddled reading that. We mentioned Emma? before about the fact that children with this condition in particular, those who have the more severe end, of, I mean, in the sense of more towards the Ulrich end compared to um, Bethlehem, let's say. So I appreciate that this, this person said that the child has a milder Ulrich, but still in the early yeah. onset form. So I think having feeding difficulties, I mentioned before, the children would have low weight. There might be difficulties. So I think this is something that, again, the neuromuscular service who looks after the child could review, could be referred to somebody to check the swallow, to see how the fast of the swallowing in general, children who have muscle weakness usually are a bit slower than the rest of the family to finish a meal. So it might not be a, a, a difficulty in swallowing, but literally just the fact that everything is a little bit slower. Um, so I think it's important to have this assessed. Uh, with the right people, speech and language therapist, um, who could do an assessment and understand what are the difficulties and perhaps discuss if perhaps. I think it's important also that, the, as, as Nathalie also said, that it remains a joy to eat and, uh, you know, like we don't, um, you know, we, we don't make it too much a struggle, particularly young kids. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. That's really, really um, important as well. Um, so sorry, I'm going to... something to add there. Oh, sorry, Natalie, um, go ahead. Just, just with the eating at home, um, keeping an eye on signs and symptoms of things changing, so coughing, um, breathlessness. If if your child is on BiPAP or you're a young adult with BiPAP and you feel that you want in your BiPAP straight away after eating and that hasn't changed, these are all signs that you should be speaking to some people that can help um, and potentially involving those dietitians sooner to, um, and speech and language to look at consistencies and foods that might be easier and, and cause less fatigue to eat. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, um, Anna. Um, there is a question that is directly for Nick, which I will ask very quickly. But Nick, I'm happy for you to respond to this afterwards. And also to bear in mind, it is a specific um, individual. Um, can you get um, contracture corrective devices for feet and ankles? Or are these um, splints? And um, are you recommending these should not be worn for longer than a few hours? This lady's daughter's eight years old. Yes, you can get them for feet, um, but they're not they're not hugely available because the the where I work, we we actually manufacture them specifically so they're bespoke for the patient. Ideally, the, the recommendation is to be worn up to one hour daily. Um, wearing it longer doesn't make any difference at all. It won't correct a correct, um, it won't help um, lengthen a muscle. Um, so the problem is that lots of other services don't have um, access to the, to the service I've got. And I'm very privileged to have access to, to the orthotics department I've got. So they are difficult to get a hold of. Thank you, Nick. Um, so I'm going to bring the Q&A to an end now, but I just wanted to ask if any of the panellists have got anything else to add that they feel they may have missed or may be useful. But there's no pressure, of course, because we've gone through quite a lot already. No? Okay. Um, so if I can just... Um, try and close this session now and like I say if you do have any future questions do get back in touch with the helpline and the info inbox and we can try and speak to our panelists to see if they can answer them so I just want to say a big thank you to all the panelists and the people that have tried to help to guide the discussions with some really great questions and comments um, you can see recordings of all the other seminars on our website already, and the recording of this session will be posted later on in the week. We'll also be in touch with a really short survey to gather some feedback on the sessions, which will be invaluable to shape 
what we do in future. And just before I forget, we did have a question in the Q&A about having more adult focused professionals for these conditions as well. That's great feedback. And it's definitely something that we've been looking at to do in the future. So we will look into that for future seminars. And there are a few coming up in the coming months as well. Um, and then just a reminder that um, MDUK's virtual information seminars are a source of information, but they should not replace direct advice from your own specialist consultant or healthcare professionals. If you have any concerns, you are advised to speak with your neuromuscular clinical team or healthcare professionals directly. So thank you very much for you all for joining us today. And the recordings, like I say, it will be available soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.